Hi, it's Alex Chadwick with Burn and Energy Journal, an ongoing public radio project about energy and climate, two closely related subjects. This time, we're going back to a reporter who started with us on our very first show, Miles O'Brien, the science journalist who works for the PBS NewsHour. Miles did reporting for us from Japan, where he was working on pieces for the first anniversary of the meltdown at Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. Six weeks ago, Miles told me he was headed back to Fukushima, and this time he would get inside the plant, one of the first journalists from anywhere to gain access. He was going for news hour, but he offered to do something for us as well, and of course we said yes, which is how I found myself talking with Miles about this story again. Miles, you're one of the few reporters who's actually been inside the original nuclear plant at Fukushima, and on your video report on this for PBS, as you're going to the plant, you describe it as, quote, one of the most hazardous places on Earth. So when you get there, they put you in this completely covered suit, a hazardous material suit, and then you go walking in. What was that moment like, and what did you see? Yeah, these are the moments, Alex, when you question your career decisions, and you think, why am I here? It was an amazing moment to be there and to be suiting up and thinking you're coming close to an unprecedented three nuclear meltdowns very close to each other and all the the witches brew of radionuclides that are still there and in piles that are still steaming hot and the idea that you're just um, driving a bus around right nearby taking pictures trying to understand the magnitude of the mess is a sobering thought indeed and of course when they put that full respirator and mask and you're wearing three layers of gloves and socks and special boots you think to yourself this is serious business even though you're a science correspondent and you know quite a lot about this it's still got to be a little scary yeah you know it's just like anything your 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 executive mind is telling you you know in a rational way i know this is okay this is radiation that is in a controlled fashion, that the suit up is going to protect me, the amount of time I spend there is going to protect me, and even the fact that I'm a short distance away from that pile of molten uh, nuclear material, even though it's a short distance, it's enough. You know all those things you know, rationally, but there's kind of that, that deep reptilian part of your brain that just tells you to run the other direction. And you know, this is what we do for a living. It's important that we go and bear witness to this and see what is really going on there. What is the current status of Fukushima Daiichi, Miles? What are the problems and how are the Japanese trying to resolve them? Well, I think you know, the lead story here is the water. There is an ongoing water issue that is really difficult for them to get a hold of. You have these melted nuclear piles. They've melted through the pressure vessels of these boiling water reactors and much of the fuel has dropped down onto concrete sub-basements. Now fortunately they poured a lot of concrete so while it has melted through some of the concrete as best they can tell, and no one can get in there, as best they can tell it has stabilized. In any case the situation is difficult and made difficult on a daily basis because what you have is thousands and thousands of gallons of groundwater that naturally passes through this terrain. And what you have with Fukushima Daiichi is a nuclear facility built right on the shore of the Pacific, sandwiched between the ocean and a, a mountain ridge. And so the water just flows through that site naturally, and it's passing right through those piles of radioactive material. And so every day, hundreds of thousands of gallons of water becomes toxic. And it is incumbent upon the Japanese and TEPCO to try not to allow that into the Pacific. It's the least they can do is to stop that flow of water into the ocean. But it is an extreme challenge. Every other day they have to finish a quarter million gallon holding tank of water in order to try to capture this water, which at some future date they hope to be able to clean up as best they can. Ultimately, they're going to run out of space for tanks and they're going to have to face the reality that they're going to have to discharge some of this water and it won't be completely free of radionuclides. So I, I keep coming up with the 
analogy in my head of, you know, from Fantasia years ago, the Sorcerer's Apprentice, you know, with the buckets of water and Mickey Mouse. They, they have a Sorcerer's Apprentice problem here with this water. And in about two or three years, there's really going to be a reckoning there as to what to do about this water. You know, already, Miles, there are traces of this water approaching the west coast of the United States. Is this a cause for worry? Well, no one likes to see the Pacific Ocean being filled with cesium-134 and 137 and strontium and so forth. We're pretty hard on our oceans as it is. But the truth of the matter is that this plume, once it arrives at the west coast of the U.S., which is really happening as we speak, once it arrives, it is so diluted that it really is far, far below. Actually, the estimates that I've heard from scientists is that, of course, you're not drinking ocean water, but if you were to drink it, the amount of uh, cesium in there is well below drinking water standards, like a thousand times below. So it's measurable. We know it comes from Fukushima because of the, the fact that cesium-134 is a part of it. That is a shorter-lived isotope of cesium and would not be linked to any of the weapons testing that occurred uh, more than 50 years ago. There still is cesium-137 in the Pacific from our, uh, you know, above ground weapons testing many years ago, but the 134 from those tests is gone. So if you see cesium-134, you know that cesium came from Fukushima and we know it's arriving on the shores of California. This has caused a lot of pseudoscience and a lot of bad blogging and a lot of rumor mongering and a lot of people waving Geiger counters in front of beaches and really when you ask the real experts, the people who study the oceans and how radioactivity dilutes in the oceans over the course of 5,000 miles, it's not going to affect either marine or human health. Well I wonder about the marine health because the fish live in the ocean. Are the fish caught close to Japan? Are they safe to eat? And, and what about fish caught off U.S. shores? Well, two categories. Fish caught off U.S. shores that would have any contact with any sort of concentration of Fukushima radionuclides would probably be bluefin tuna because of their amazing migratory patterns. They go back and forth uh, across the Pacific on a routine basis. They're amazing creatures. So that is of concern, and Nicholas Fisher at Stony Brook University has looked at that, and he's measured the amount of cesium in uh, bluefin tuna caught off of San Diego, some of it caught uh, as recently as four months after the meltdowns. And again, he found on the order of 10 becquerels per kilogram of cesium in those fish. And in Japan, where they have the most stringent standards for radionuclides in food, the allowable limit is 100 becquerels. So it is still while measurable, not an amount that one would consider unsafe. Of course, nobody likes the idea of eating cesium from Fukushima. Now, when you get closer to the plant, and we went out with a fisherman who was uh, pulling in some flounder, bottom fish. He wasn't pulling them in to eat because they're banned for sale. He was pulling them in to test them to see whether they are anywhere near the possibility of getting back in business as fishermen. The flounder that he pulled up on this particular mission were well within the limits and would have been safe, but he also on another day has pulled up some that are way above. So it's going to take a very long time before these bottom fish that are close to Fukushima will ever be fit for consumption. And because as much as anything, a lot of the cesium has settled into the sediment, and so it's going to linger there a little longer. Miles, you've been following this story since it happened three years ago. You've done reporting for Burn on it in the past. Anything on this trip to change your perspective? Yeah, so, you know, I think what changed the most, Alex, is, you know, I think we all want these horrible things to kind of uh, be over, right? I had the sense that things were more over than they are. This really is just beginning in so many ways. We're talking about 30 to 40 years of very hard, very difficult work to decommission the Fukushima Daiichi site. And with the, the groundwater issue that I've just talked about, the whole issue of how you get that fuel out of there safely and contained, this is an ongoing crisis. And I think while the, the Japanese have turned to outside help more recently and have reached out to experts all over the world, this is an issue that really is an international issue, and it's important that we all keep our eye on it. The Japanese are, are working hard and are using their best engineering skills and are using their best robotic skills to come up with 
devices that might be able to go in there and start cleaning up uh, remotely. But the fact of the matter is we owe it to the Pacific Ocean, which we all have a lot of interest in, to watch this very carefully, make sure the Japanese are honest and frank about it, and that TEPCO is more transparent than it has been. And up to this point, the Japanese have not been great at this. They're getting better, but we need to hold them accountable for this cleanup for a long time. Well, there is the role of, uh, as you say, TEPCO, the Tokyo Electric Power Company that owns uh, Fukushima and has been trying to manage this disaster for uh, three years now, but not with a public record that would inspire a lot of confidence. No. I mean, you know, these tanks I was telling you about, it's very difficult to get a handle on all the leaks that they have. And, and of course, as a result, there is tainted water that is being dumped into the Pacific as we speak. The actual impact to the ocean is, it appears to be, according to the data, fairly well limited to the harbor area around the Fukushima Daiichi plant, but no one likes to hear those stories. And, you know, TEPCO from the beginning, culturally, stonewalled at every front, including admitting that there were meltdowns. It took them quite some time to even admit that simple fact. So they have brought in some experts from the U.S. who have some experience with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and Three Mile Island, and it appears they're listening to them on this idea that you, you have to be a little more forthcoming with the public, because as much as anything, it is a public relations effort to explain to people what you're doing as transparently as possible. This goes against a lot of the cultural and corporate grain in uh, Japan where consensus is important and you don't say anything until everybody agrees on something. And as a result, it looks like they're trying to sit on secrets. Miles, let me ask you another question, if I may, this one more personal. This reporting trip ended for you in the Philippines where through a unexpected and a terrible personal accident, you you lost your left arm or a good part of it. Just tell me, how is this recovery process going for you? You know, and to think I was worried about going into Fukushima. You just never know what uh, is going to uh, bite you on the backside, as they say, Alex. Yeah, I was in the Philippines picking up an additional story, this one on genetically modified crops, which is a separate story uh, entirely from the Fukushima events, and uh, had a heavy case fall on my arm. It developed this thing I'd never heard of called uh, acute compartment syndrome, and before I knew it, I was having emergency surgery, and I woke up without a left arm. I woke up alive, though. That's good. So to say that's a shock is an understatement. I, I got to admit, one of the first things I thought when that initial shock wore off was, geez, you know, I just spent all this time and effort going to Fukushima. I want to make sure these stories get on <laughs> TV somewhere, you know, and so I just, I kind of just dove right back into work, but I'll be okay. There's, there's workarounds for almost anything, and, you know, I'm kind of a gadget guy. I'll find a way to make it work. Reporter Miles O'Brien. Miles, back from Fukushima with a story again. Thank you. Reporter Miles O'Brien. Go to our website and you'll find links to the features Miles did for the NewsHour. There's also a link to the interview the NewsHour did with Miles about his accident. We're at burnandenergyjournal.com. Burn is a project of Sound Vision Productions with funding from the Sloan Foundation. I'm Alex Chekwin. Oh yeah, go on, click the subscribe button. We need to get subscribed and get this unity stronger and beat YouTube at their own game. Okay, that's what this is about. Like I say, go to the remix button, hit the remix button. That way you'll have this video and, and keep up with this. Otherwise, you know, YouTube's just going to control us, guys, and it's, it's really bad.